O send out thy light and thy truth, that they may lead me and bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy dwelling. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which ought to have done and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips. And our mouth shall show forth thy grace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia.
reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Sure the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! There is none other than the, God of, the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone on which he had put his, under his head and set up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Another parable Jesus put before the crowds. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And the disciples approached him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, 
and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will be thrown into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I admit that one of my favorite phrases out of the New Testament is gnashing of teeth. It's not because of punishment that it implies. It's simply such a rich, dramatic, almost cartoon-like image. The difficulty of this is that it is the fodder for hell, fire, and brimstone preaching. It would be easy to take this as a justification that there are evil people in the world choking out the good ones. But our context always holds us back a bit as we discern and as we distinguish what a message of good news this could be. This parable follows directly after last week's. It is an agricultural setting still. And like last week's, it must be understood in the context of Matthew's community. We know in our Christian past that this has been used as a way to throw away the Jewish people, to elevate the Christians. We know that this has been a way for Christians to fight and spar with one another about who are weeds and who are the wheat. 
But the context of this teaching is in Matthew's community that is thoroughly Jewish. And it is not a finger pointing that says Christianity is better because there wasn't a Christianity as we would know it at that time. There were Christian Jews, Jews that were following this Jesus as the Christ and saw him as the fulfillment of this kingdom of heaven and the one to usher it in, the very heart of Jewish belief. And there were those who were not following. And this situation was one of confusion. How, how could there be this difference within this same family of faith? These parables belong to Judaism. And they describe an inner conflict in the community that will eventually, yes, separate it. But not in the time that Jesus is preaching. In the time that Jesus is preaching and living, the enemy was not religious authorities unless they were in cahoots with an empire. And we know that those lines were all blurred in that world. So yes, it was a religious conversation, but much more, it was a broader cultural one under a people that were dominated by a foreign empire and how it is that they could live out that faith and live out that hope of a kingdom of heaven coming in that very situation. This agricultural setting is so important to understand because it unpacks so much that's in this very small parable. The wheats that are referred to here, or the weeds rather, were those realities of a very nauseous plant in that world that when it sprung up resembled wheat. And it wasn't until it began to grow and sprout that it was clear what it was. And by that time the wheat had sprouted and so, as Jesus explains, you do not try to uproot that for fear that you'll disturb the wheat or the children that are firmly rooted. It's not a statement that the weeds are bad. Weeds are weeds. They can be quite beautiful and lovely if they're in their place among other weeds. The problem is when they're in the wrong space, in the wrong soil, they're out of place. And then they do choke out that which is around them. It is a parable that is about the problem of evil. And as I heard the community discuss last week in coffee hour, is it time that we start to talk about evil a little more? And I thought, next week is, is when it comes. It's right there. The problem of evil. And I'm going to use an illustration that I would assume many of you know. It's so simple, but I think is so profoundly distinguishing of what evil really is. Evil is live, spelled backwards. If we're moving into life, and if we're moving into life with Jesus as this teacher and this guide, we are moving toward a kingdom of heaven. A kingdom or a relationship, an experience of life in God that is good and is a furthering of the life that God gives to everything that is good. And everything in creation is good. Wheat and weeds. And children of the light and even children of the darkness. 
there is not a dualism between the good world and the evil world and we often make that assumption and hear that assumption in especially our Christian perspective but that is not present here evil is to move in a way that reverses life and to move away from living we can't talk about evil without talking about our tradition and where we see that coming from one of them is mentioned here Satan but as I've told you so often and I think as we know if we look at our tradition we know that Satan is not evil by nature Satan is a perfect created being an angel and Satan's movement is one in which that life is not enough the life that Satan desires is the life of God to be equal to be on that level and that is his fallen nature early in scripture he is simply an advocate term for an attorney where he comes up as one who poses the other side it's very much a courtroom setting it's quite later that he develops into that fiery pitchfork wielding image that's so typical in cartoons and unfortunately in our minds Satan in this parable is the one who plants his seed weeds right alongside of God's seeds of wheat vying for competition who can have the greater harvest And we're told over and over and especially in Matthew's setting maybe one of the most difficult things about our brushes with evil is that we have to be patient and we have to wait for God to make that discernment it doesn't mean that we don't do anything it doesn't mean we stand idly by it means that we walk in the way of life that we know that is open that's always discerning and that's rooted in right action how are we to know what that is if we would look at our Christian beginnings we see that the word for sin is not what most people think it is today the word in Greek is hamartia and it means to miss the mark it is not really to commit an offense or a mistake which came to our tradition quite later when Latin entered and the word for sin became peccare or in English peccadillo a mistake a fault a break a sin harmatia is a richer concept because harmatia always implies the possibility of transformation harmatia holds the reality of the person as a good created being that's in process and what is our role in that our role is to be part of that process as I said last week part of that process that tends to the soil and the environment that people are placed in not to look at someone declare them evil and abandon them that isn't our job it isn't even God's in a final judgment that decision will be made but I suspect it's largely made by the people who in that final opportunity turn away and decide that walking in a kingdom of heaven is not the walk that they want 
There's another story in the very beginning of our tradition that introduces the concept of what will become evil to us. And it's a story we know so well, but do we hear it properly or accurately? It's Adam and Eve and a serpent. And before there's a Satan on the scene, there is that serpent. That might be a better image to hold for Satan or the devil, a tempter, a serpent who's cunning, the most cunning of all the creatures, a serpent that also wants an equality with the Creator. And so he turns to God's providence, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he sets that gift up as a foil. In that story, all of the trees in the garden are free for Adam and Eve, for us as humanity, to tend, to take fruit from, with the exception of this one tree. And it's not an evil tree, it's a tree of knowledge, it's the tree of God. It is the symbol or the emanation of God's very presence in the world. But that discernment between good and, e and evil, that discernment of knowledge is God's role and no one else's. And if Adam and Eve and even the serpent had been willing to live in that kind of reality, there would be no need for the story to go on. The serpent knows the temptation and weakness of other created beings and so offers this apple to Eve. She eats it, she gives it to Adam, and then God appears. What is the sin of Adam and Eve? It isn't eating the apple. It is the lack of discernment to stay in their place of relationship with God. It is like Satan's, their desire to know all things, to be on par with God. And it's because of that basic human reality, that basic human condition, the rest of the story proceeds. And we find ourselves often in the same place as Adam and Eve with multiple apples. Which ones are the good ones to eat and which ones are we really forbidden to? Discernment is really such the key to dealing with the problem of right and wrong and good and bad and evil. To distinguish between to be able to put yourself in relationship with God and not act as a God in how it is that your life is going to be lived, especially with other human beings and with all parts of this created reality. It's such a rich parable for us as we face so many decisions every day. And a virus that's so mysterious and so unseen and yet we know the results and yet we don't want our lives to be that turned upside down and it's not going to come to us. And even as I said last week, people of faith gathering in churches who will proclaim, if God wants me to get the virus, I will. And if God doesn't want me to, I won't. <laughs> I guess you can hold that if that works for you, but you have to remember, it's not just you 
that's going to get it unless you're willing to block yourself out, separate from everything. That sounds like a horrid punishment. It sounds like the reality of this parable. Are we mindful of how it is that our behavior influences, impacts, and brings life or death to so many? Do we want to be a community of transformation or do we want to be a community of transaction? Transaction implies no real life. It implies that we're stuck in what we think is good and how it is that we've come to live. And we're not going to change. We're not going to discern. We're no different then than that serpent or really that Satan figure. We're, we're going to be on par with God and we'll be just fine. But those lives don't last very long because they're not rooted in the life that God offers. That's always one of transformation that's always one of putting ones in another place, oneself in another place, considering all of the realities that our decisions can make. Here's the good sower, Jesus, and we know what the end of his life will be. It will be death, no differently than the weeds. But because he continues to live in that reality of God, we experience him resurrected, transformed, standing again in new life. And if we believe that, and it becomes the root of our transformation, then we as the body of Christ move with that presence in this world. And we invite all into that transforming presence, whether we see them as good seeds and wheat or whether we see them as weeds. But the most difficult thing for us, I know, and we're so tired of hearing it, is that we have to wait. But we have to wait all of our lives for that reality to come to us in fruition. And that is Matthew's message in Jesus. In the end, there will be the reality of life in this kingdom of heaven. And how that kingdom of heaven comes about is largely the responsibility of how it is we act in this kingdom of the world. We'll pray for that journey when we hear our office hymn today. Oh, what their joy and their glory must be, those endless Sabbaths the blessed ones see, crown for the valiant to weary ones rust, God shall be all, and in all ever blessed. Now, in the meantime, with hearts raised on high, we for that country must yearn and must sigh, seeking Jerusalem, dear native land, through our long exile on Babylon's strand. But we hear God's promise again to one of the earliest in our tradition, to Jacob. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Amen. I believe in God, 
the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in thee can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under thy care, and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let thy way be known upon earth, thy saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with thy Holy Spirit. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, who knowest our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking, have compassion, we beseech thee, upon our infirmities, and those things which for our unworthiness we dare not, and for our blindness we cannot ask, mercifully give us for the worthiness of thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, who maketh us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of thy Son, our Lord, grant us this day such blessing through our worship of thee, that the days to come may be spent in thy favor, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, who hast made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and didst send thy blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near, grant that people everywhere may seek after thee and find thee. Bring the nations into thy fold, pour out thy Spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of thy kingdom, through the same, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and has promised through thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore.